Mr P, mm -hmm. also known as Lee Parkinson, welcome to the Teachers Podcast. Thank you, Thank you so very much, much for, me. for joining us. Um, what's really exciting is that we asked you to come on board, you said yes, and then when I asked uh, who would they like, they said you. So I was really excited about that because I was like, oh, I can say that we're doing that. Yeah. So that's really, really good. Um, and that's why we've got so many questions for you yeah. from the listeners as well. So I'm going to switch it around slightly for this one. Okay. Um, so I've seen a lot of what you've done. I'm sure a lot of other teachers have. But sometimes what we're missing is like the first bit. So it'd be really helpful if you could sort of tell us your journey into teaching and then yeah. throughout teaching. Okay. So tell us that story to start with, to give people a background. Yeah, no worries. Um, so I, I've been teaching now for about 12 years. I straight out of school, straight out of sixth form. Uh, didn't really know what I wanted to, well, I actually wanted to be an actor. That was my uh, dream when I was younger. Uh, tried to get into- So did or, I. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Tried to get onto an acting course at uni, didn't quite happen, so went into teaching, four year BA uh, honours degree at my Met, and um, interestingly, in my third year, the placement, I came about this close to completely packing it in, and uh, it's a funny, I always share it on some of my, tr on some of my training when, you know, uh, I say to, or when I get messages from teachers and they're sort of struggling at the school, I always say, look, it's probably not you, it's the school, and um and I had that experience, I started the placement and I hold my hands up, I was what, 20, 21. So I was very much making the most out of the uni experience and I was yeah. playing the rugby team, on the rugby team and that sort of thing. So I probably wasn't giving or putting in as much as I needed to at the placement, but within a week, the deputy head at the place at the school turned around and said, we're not passing you. Like, it was a 10 week placement, wow. end of the first week, there's no way in which you're passing this, this mm -hmm. placement. So I had this really, really tough class uh, behaviour issue, all, all sorts going on. The teacher that I was with, the class teacher that I was with as well, got pregnant halfway through my placement, but she wasn't married and it was a Catholic school. So she had all that going on of having to speak to the priest about that. So there was, and I think that was, uh, you know, so... Um, it didn't help. It didn't help. It was just one of them. And you know what? We don't, we don't treat the teachers like the children, do we? You know, we say yeah. the children are allowed chances and the teachers aren't. Yeah, yeah. So um, I really tried my best to knuckle down and get on with it. And it was just constantly brick wall of no, you know. And uh, so I ended up getting in touch with Universe. I remember sitting on my mum's bed and saying, I don't think I can do this, I'm not cut out for it, et cetera. And my mum said, no, no, contact the uni, it's not you, it's the school. And luckily someone from uni came in, uh, spent the morning with me and she just said, look, see the placement through, mm -hmm. we'll get you at another school for a few weeks. Uh, nothing to worry about, it's not you, it's the school. And uh, yeah, so I ended up at another school and sort of never looked back. It was just, it was, it was probably about half a mile away, the school but just a completely different experience and then never looked back really. So I ended up at my school, Davian Primary, started there, like I say, 12 years ago. Um, and yeah, just I love that school. I think it's uh, amazing. It's not perfect, no school is. Uh, we have our challenges and, uh, you know, we're not quite the finished product yet, but I've always felt like I've been able to uh, grow and, and, and been challenged. And it was really the circumstances in my life that changed. So I got married in 2010 and then the year after, we found out we were expecting, um, oh no, actually, we got married in 2010, we found out we were expecting in the October, went to the first scan, as you do. So I've got a, a stepson as well, so he was about six, seven, took him along to the scan. And we sat there and uh, they start, you know, putting the ultrasound on my wife's yeah. stomach. And then the nurse gets, sort of moves the screen away from us and gets this really concerned face, uh, look on her face. So we're starting to panic. Um, and then she just said, have you having, been having any fertility treatment? I said, no, just like that. So uh, yeah, we were expecting triplets. So our circumstances changed quite a bit. I just cannot imagine how, how that even went down. We've got a three-year-old right now who is just a nightmare. Like yeah. how, how, how do you have three three-year-olds? Uh, I don't know. People always ask me that now because I was quite young when we had them. So I was about 25, 26. And uh, uh, a lot of my friends now are having children and they're always saying to me, you know, how did you do it? And I, I can all, it was a blur. It was an absolute blur. The first year or so, an absolute blur. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we've come out the other side. They're amazing. They're incredible, all four of them. So uh, my stepson now is getting his GCSE results in a week or oh, two. Wow. So that's wow. uh, interesting. And um, 
And, and yeah, so uh, it, was, it was looking like I was going to have to sort of step up and look at management roles in school. And uh, my head teacher recognised that. And that's what's been amazing about my head teacher is he's always looked at ways to progress staff and um, help them to where they want to go. So he said to me, he said, look, so I did that first year and probably because I look so tired. He sort of said, look, what we're going to look at doing, because I know you want to go into management, is we'll bring you out of the classroom and you can cover PPA across the school. Um, because at that point, I'd only really taught Key Stage 2. So sort of getting experience down UIFS Key Stage 1 to then eventually look at maybe moving on to um, uh, assistant head, deputy, whatever it might be. And he said, look, we'll look at um, you developing your curriculum area, which at the time was ICT, uh, purely by fluke, because I can turn stuff off and on at the mains, you yeah, know. Yeah the trick of every ICT coordinator. Uh, and I got that role from making a video at the year six Leavers Assembly in my NQT year. I've got a few photos of the time of the children, the, 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 the memories through school, and then put, I think it was the Green Day song, Time of Your Life, and the head teacher was like, right, that's it. It's Oscar award winning that, you can yeah. be ICT coordinator. You know so everything that, yeah, about yeah. ICT because so then, you did that. Yeah, so then um, I sort of had the opportunity to develop uh, our VLE early days and had a TLR, alpha, a TLR for that. Uh, so I was, I was uh, and but the problem was at the time the sort of hardware at the school we had two ICT suites one infant one junior, and I just didn't like that idea of it just being static all the time. And the thing with with the ICT suite is loads of lap, uh, computers weren't working; they were very temperamental, all that sort of stuff. So I said, look, I, I'm happy to do this, but I want uh, we need to invest in better tech. And so we bought a class set of iPads, and then my role was sort of working with year groups. Um, you know, work with a year group in the morning, year group in the afternoon uh, for a half term, just looking at ways in which sort of mobile technology can enhance learning. Uh, we, it was the same time that we started a school Twitter account, school Facebook page, and we were starting to see the impact from that and the way it was engaging the, the, the wider world and giving our pupils an audience for the writing and the work they were doing. So that, that was having a real big impact. And then um, we were getting loads of followers on our school uh, Twitter page and it was um, Julian Woods, the Ideas Factory on Twitter, who um, said, you know, you should start your own teacher Twitter account, which I did, and then started sharing the how-to videos and, and, and blog posts from there. Um, and uh, yeah, it just grew from there, started the Facebook page as well, I think about 2012. And um, by the end of that academic year, I was being asked to do training sessions, and then the next minute, Alan Pete got in touch with me, um, which, you know, has always been one of my heroes. He's probably one of the most inspirational people in teaching for me personally. I had an inset day with him mm -hmm. just before I went on my paternity leave, actually. And, uh, he and was did you only get the two weeks or did they give you six, you know, one for each time? Oh, no, no, you don't get any preferential <laughs> treatment. No, you get nothing. It was like two weeks. But it was interesting because it was the year uh, 2011. It was the royal wedding. And do you remember that year where you had Easter, but it wasn't on the Easter... Oh weekend. yeah, the first time so, yeah. that happened, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so it was amazing because the kids were born on Mother's Day, which was 3rd of April, and then we had two weeks off for Easter, then we had the Easter weekend, then we had the bank holiday, and then we had the um, royal the wedding. Extra day, yeah. So I, pretty much, I think it was like I was in for a whole week over a seven week period yeah. really, so it was all right, it was okay. Because um, he spent the first part, I didn't take paternity until he came out of the neonatal ward anyway, oh, so. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, so Alan Pete got in touch. He said, you know, we're, we're interested in bringing someone on board who can look at technology and that sort of thing. And so I went and met him and we had a discussion. And uh, yeah, he came back and said, look, we'd love to bring you on board. Uh, not to work for him, but he was going to help us set up as a business and we'd work on behalf of him. And, you know, I can never be uh, so grateful for all the support both him and Julie gave me in those early days. Uh, it was just incredible. And so I learned a hell of a lot about the business side of this from from him yeah yeah and uh we did a lot of work together wrote a few books together and that sort of thing but he's sort of retired now so he's enjoying his retirement and uh yeah the rest is history so it's just sort of grown from there really and started doing inset in schools and training in schools and um obviously sharing stuff on my blog on my facebook page and then that sort of started to grow more and then i just started sharing funny little clips of uh, you know life as a teacher and that's so true to... though i watch them and i think do you know what you've you've definitely got it down to what it actually is yeah yeah and i think that's um the thing about teaching is no matter where you are wherever you're teaching in the world is that universal life as a teacher that we can all appreciate and have a laugh at because you know if we didn't laugh we'd cry and uh and so yeah it's just sort of grown from there and it's um it's amazing, really. It's it's incredible that social media has sort of given me the, 
the platform and the opportunities that, that it has. And um, so I still work part time in my school. I'm still there one, two days. I'm actually contracted to one day a week. But um, if I'm free, I'll go in and help out wherever I can. And then there's that flexibility either way. Um, yeah, it's just amazing. I love it. Absolutely love it. Thank you for that, because I think that's just been so insightful, because I think oh. we've all followed you uh, yeah, yeah. for a long time, but you can't always piece it all together. Just want to um, just touch on something you mentioned. Um, so obviously, when you were doing your um, uni course, there was a time when you thought that you weren't going to make it. Um, do you think that's made you approach things differently? So where a teacher might um, experience that in the career, they might be scared, because you kind of came up against that, and yeah. you realised that a different school was different. Do mm -hmm. you think... It's made you a little bit more confident or a bit more bullish or do you see um, kind of what I'm asking? Yeah, yeah. And, and and I was probably lucky that I got that so early in my career to then appreciate what I got at, at Davium. And yeah. and that's the thing I think we, we this, the, as teachers, you only, a lot of the time, we only ever see the problem within our own school. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, we can then lose sight and, and not appreciate how good we've got it in certain ways. And I, I, don't get me wrong, a lot, of, a lot of schools struggling at the minute and teachers are having that battle. But, you know, in my school, you know, we don't really have a big staff turnover. In fact, I think this year is probably the biggest one uh, for a while. But that's just people going off onto bigger and better things, you know. Yeah. Um, and I, th I think there's probably three quarters of the teachers, not exactly, but around about three quarters, where that school is the only school they've ever worked at. And so I think that says a lot about the it school. It does, it does. But then at the same time, you find that they tend to get uh, worked up about stuff that on the grand scheme of things, where if I'm in a position now where I'm being messaged every day about certain things going on in schools, I'll go to and visit certain schools where I'm like, you know, bloody hell, uh, don't want to work here. Um, you know, you then appreciate what you've got more. So I think, again, social media is great for that because social media does give you, uh, opens the, the world. It's kind of like a moderation of kind of the, the I don't know, the social things going yeah. on as well, isn't it? And like I, and the I've climate. Probably, it'd probably been a lot better for me if social media was around at that time because I'd have been able to go onto Facebook, maybe go on some of these Facebook groups and sort of say, look, this is happening. Should it be happening? Yeah. You know, is there anyone I can speak to? Is there anywhere where I, where I can go? And, um, you know, that's there for a lot of teachers now. And you see it all the time on... on oh, you do, you, yeah. You'll get it on your page, I get it on my page where questions are asked and there's that really support su supportive network there, which is good. But then you, you do get the negatives as well. Yeah, but that's yeah. that social media it brings the best and worst out of people, I suppose, doesn't it? Yeah. I, and I completely agree with that because you know, I've got connections with the school where actually I think it was um, it was quite good in comparison to all the schools I was going into because I was on supply at the time. And yeah. then and then they did kind of it all crept in mm. of everything that was happening everywhere else. Oh. And that's when you appreciate the good old days. Yeah. Um, but it is hard because every school, even though we're all doing the same thing, is very different. Isn't oh, it's absolutely. This is interesting about the whole curriculum debate at the minute, because that's going to be the one this year, isn't it? It's all about the curriculum, because Ofsted say it's about the curriculum, even Ofsted have created the reason why. It's like we've never taught a curriculum before, yeah. you know? And we have. It's just that Ofsted created a culture where it was all about the results. So the only way you're going to get the results is to narrow your curriculum. And now Ofsted are saying, we don't want to take responsibility for that, so we're going to change the goalpost almost. But the thing with the curriculum is it's going to be it's so uh, unique to your school in lots of ways. So, you know, it, it can't be something that you go out onto the internet and buy because one school's curriculum, even if it's half a mile down the road from you, is going to be very different to your school. So, you know, it's making sure that curriculum is meaningful to you and purposeful to your pupils. Yeah, yeah. And how are you going to deliver that also by having a life work balance? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, so I'm going to get through um, some of the questions that yeah. we've had. Um, so Stuart Tiffany has asked mm -hmm. two questions, so I'll ask his first one. So he says, where do you see technology in the classroom going in the next five years? Oh, interesting. Um, <laughs> well, I've, I've, I've been doing this now for, for, I'd say, at least five years. And I'd, on the whole, I don't think we've moved forward as much as I'd like. So where I'd like it to be is probably going to be very different to where it actually goes. Um, you know... As I'll come on and talk about, my big focus now and a lot, a lot of the training that I'm doing is getting teachers to look at ways technology can make their life easier. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I've been doing things, I'd say, for five years where technology has made, my, you know, made me do my job a bit more efficiently, more effectively. And I'm still talking through those ideas with teachers now. So it is, it, 
I'd like us to be a little bit more, look at te technology more creatively than we are at the minute. That's what I'd like, but that needs a whole culture shift in teaching to give teachers time to develop that. Is it just knowledge. culture or is it funding as well? Oh, funding massively, yeah. Yeah, funding's a big one, absolutely. I think that's probably the, one of, probably the biggest reason why schools don't make as much out of technology at the minute. And that's what I'll get most because messages about. Progress with it, yeah. And I always get asked, you know, we're, we're looking at, because a lot of schools at the minute are, are at the point where the six, seven years into a set of iPads that they bought, those iPads now aren't updating. And um, so they're sort of saying, right, we need to replace them, but the cost, iPads are a little bit more expensive. Right, Mr. P, can you recommend another uh, iPad or tablet we can use? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm always like, you're not going to get a better tablet than the iPad, yeah, you know. Yeah. And the problem is, is that schools don't utilise it enough to justify the justify cost. Justify the cost, yeah. So that's what I'm trying to do now is focus on ways in which, look, we, if you invest. So I've had a school recently that have saved, what was it, that they've, um, I think about near, near 10 grand in two years by using ideas off the train through the technology, yeah, um, nice. which has reduced photocopying. And more importantly, giving teachers the time back, yeah, which yeah. you know we'll get we'll get onto a little bit later. Which is important. Um, okay, thank you. Right, your second question because he's greedy. Yeah. Um, do you think we as teachers are running the risk of becoming over reliant on technology? Um, huh. I don't know. Possibly, possibly. But at the same well, time, we all? yeah. As a yeah, I mean. I think there's got to be a lot, a lot more education around understanding technology, especially with social media. Um, you know, I think if you look at our society over the past few years and everything that's happened and how split our society has become, I think the biggest reason for that is a complete lack of, lack of understanding with social media mm. and the whole fake news. Have you seen The Great Hack on Netflix yet? No, right. I, know, I don't have time to watch Netflix. Right. <laughs> the Great Hack on Netflix is a must watch. Um, data is now the most, uh, you know, it's more expensive than oil. It is it's getting children and people educated about understanding their data and making sure they're aware of what they do with their data and that sort of thing is so, so important. And, you know, it's been, just watch that great hack. I'm not going to go into it all now, but it gives you, it I'm opens awesome. your eyes to just how naive we all are with, with social media at the minute. And a big, big focus of mine now is getting children. And it's this thing, because I get a lot of schools who say, uh, we can't, we can't talk about social media with our pupils. If we talk, if we teach about social media, we're encouraging them to use it. And it's such a cop out, uh, it really winds me up that. Yeah. Um, Whereas for me, it's about preparing children. That is the world they're growing up into. And it's not encouraging them to use it. It's making them aware of it and understanding it. And, you know, you've only got to look at... They're going to use it anyway. Yeah, yeah. And, and so I don't think we're becoming over-reliant on it yet because I just don't think we utilise it enough yet to become over-reliant on it. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, not in school anyway. They're not in school, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, okay, so we've had a lot of questions about apps like... Most of the questions were about apps, all different types of so mm -hmm. best apps for visually impaired children, best apps for EYFS, best apps on a budget, best apps for EAL. So what are the best apps of all those, in your opinion, that schools should be using? And have you got somewhere we can point them to yeah, yeah. So, a bit more detail? Um, yeah, so uh, alongside all my training now, I've, I've launched a website, uh, mrpict.com which we'll yeah, yeah. teachers and schools can subscribe to. And it's basically a website where I'm moving all my CPD online. So I'm just uh, demonstrating app tutorials, looking at ways in which the apps can enhance the, the whole curriculum, that sort of thing. Um, so it's not a resource website, it's more of a CPD website for teachers to go and say, right, I want to know how I can use technology more effectively in history and there'll be apps yeah, and right. ideas there. So there's an app tutorials page on that. And it's got all the apps that I've done videos about so far. And I think uh, the, the, there's, a, there's a bit of a problem in those questions of, because there's been that sort of mentality of there's an app for everything. And my, my thing now is that's not the way to approach it, is that we've got to become more familiar with the type of apps we want to be using in schools. So uh, I think most of those questions are very much focusing on the way people use technology, which is as a consumer. Yeah. So we tend to, most of us, uh, will use technology as consumers. So the mo main things we tend to do is browse the internet, browse social media, watch videos, play video games, listen to music, and what's the other one? Read eBooks. Right? Yeah. And now that has a place in the classroom, and there's some great apps you can use 
uh, that fit into that umbrella. Mm -hmm. For example, Times Tables Rockstars, yeah. right? So that's a brilliant app and um, you know, it's a great way for children to acquire, acquire knowledge and practice quick recall and be, engaged. and be engaged. But that if that's the only way in which you're using technology in school, where children are getting half an hour on time tables, rock stars a week. They could do that at home. They can do it at home. And it's and, and that's the thing, most children, that's what they're doing at home. Mm -hmm. So that this is where I get annoyed at the uh, digital native, you know, um, phrase. Oh, we don't need to teach children about technology, just digital natives. No, 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 they're, they're good at being consumers. Where we need to push technology in schools is moving from being consumers to being creators. Yeah. So you're not just watching. They're going to have to create it. You're, create, you're recording videos, you're not reading e-books, you're designing e-books and so on and so on. And in, it's in that that you go from not just engaging to empowering as well. So um, I'm very much about looking at ways in which technology can be used for children to create. And then that can be adapted to so many different you know so an app let's take for example book creator that allows the children to create their own ebook about absolutely anything embed video pictures they've added this auto draw option which is incredible so that can be used for everything mm -hmm. that can be used for we've done 2d 3d shape ebooks where the children are drawing pictures of different shapes and then talking about the properties and you know making that so much more accessible you can make ebooks about um you know, the Tudors, if that's your topic, but it's about the children actually creating content to demonstrate their learning. Yeah. And this is where I think we're, we can be struggling a lot with this knowledge rich curriculum that everyone's going on about. And we've got to be careful that we don't interpret knowledge rich as just knowing facts. Now that is important, don't get me wrong, I'm not one of these, uh, just because I don't want the Twitter backlash of saying <laughs> I'm a progressive and it's not about, knowledge underpins everything. You cannot be creative without knowledge, you know, so you've, you've got to have a solid understanding. But what we're at risk of, if we're not careful, is if we don't give children the opportunities to create with that knowledge and apply that knowledge creatively, what's the point? Yeah. You know, and... and also, they're not going to remember it in the same way. I think no. you can learn it, but you forget it easily unless yeah. you apply it and you do something that you're really proud of. yeah. And that's the, this is where like test it, testing can fall down. Now testing is a great, like you look at the whole SATs stuff in our country at the minute and SATs is not fit for purpose. I don't mind children doing tests if those tests are used for what they should be, which is assessment. Assess, SATs isn't assessment. SATs is used as a stick to hit schools and teachers with. But it's like the whole SPAG stuff. The whole SPAG curriculum ultimately is a complete and utter waste of time because of the test. Yeah. So you, you take every year seven kid now mm -hmm. and you give them the spag test from this year i guarantee most if not all would probably fail it yeah. because a lot of that learning hasn't stuck no and they're not because doing it's just, it anymore and and the problem is with the spag stuff is uh, we, we only focus on the what have you come across simon senek stuff yes yeah yes. the golden circle yeah. right so i use that a lot i talk about all the time on my training applying it to the curriculum and that sort of thing but I apply it to the spag stuff as well. So if you've not seen it, if you go on YouTube and you just Google um, Simon Sinek starting with why, it's this most, what, no, one of what, the whole book. yeah, yeah, the book's amazing. Yeah. But it's one of the most watched TED Talks of all time. And he says like, the reason why so many businesses fail is they focus on the what. Um, and the most successful businesses start with the why. why. Yeah. Now, if you look at that with the spag curriculum, the spag curriculum or the spag test, we only ever focus on the what. So what's that called? What's that an example of? You know, what's the adjective in this sentence? And so the children get through the test by focusing on the what. And it doesn't make them better writers no. because what we're not doing is we're not teaching the why. We're not telling them why they need to know it. Yeah. But we don't know the answer. But, yeah, but the, <laughs> well, it's, it's, more, it's about focusing it in. It, so for me, I, I'm very much, and what, what you get at the minute is a lot of schools teaching it sort of bottom up of, of, of you know, this is an apostrophe and what an apostrophe does is, is changes it's, it, it to it's whatever. Hmm. Here's this worksheet where you're going to circle where the apostrophe should go. And not getting through the test, but they're not going to use apostrophes for affecting the writing because mm. they've not seen it in a piece of writing. Yeah. So the focus should be much more on a top-down approach. Let's see it in context. As we're reading it, let's look at that. Oh, what's that an example of? So you can still cover, cover the what? Oh, it's a, a fronted adverbial. Right, brilliant. But more importantly, why has the author used that? Yeah. What impact does that have us, on us as readers? And when you focus on that, it completely flips it. And then that's where you see the progression in writing because yeah. the children aren't using it because you're forcing them. They're using it because they know how to and the, the you know. So, Kath Smith says, do you still use and recommend any old tech? I don't really know what she means by that. Hopefully you do. What, like pens and pencils? Yeah, use pens and pencils. <laughs> it's interesting that, isn't it? Because I, I show this slide on my training that has quotes from teachers over the years about how they dismissed like the pen. 
yeah. and they, they go on about how this is going to ruin the etiquette, you know, and it's funny because we always do that with new technology that came along. When the printing press was first released, monks were up in arms about it. They couldn't handle it because it was going to put them out of a job. Yeah. And um, and I, I look, the pen, pen paper is still so, so important. And what we tend to do is we tend to always look at technology to substitute what we're already doing and replace what we're already doing. My thing is that's not what we should be looking at. We should be looking at ways in which the technology can enhance what we're already doing. So, um, so yeah, so if it still works, then absolutely, you know, I still, in our school, we still will use a little um, sound buttons in EYFS mm -hmm. um, and other bits and bobs. But, you know, I think in the world we live in now and the, the content children are accessing outside of school, the fact that with just that device, they can create so much similar, yeah. that is just so powerful. So, um, yeah, I, I t what, what's interesting? If it still works, yes. Yeah, if it still works, but at the same time, like I don't use interactive whiteboards now because I just don't, I've never liked them. Mm -hmm. I just don't think they're that, that like, interactive for a class of 30. They're interactive if you've got a class of one. Yes, yes, but no, you're right. But what I can do with my computer and a few iPads is I can put my computer up to the, so we, have, we don't have interactive whiteboards in our school now because we were looking at getting them replaced and we were getting quoted, quoted like 3,500 uh, £3, pounds for these new mm -hmm. ones and we thought, well, actually we could get eight iPads per class for that and still save a couple of hundred quid. So we went down that route, big TV screens in the, in the classroom, plug your laptop in, and then this software on our laptops that allowed us, allow us to mirror the uh, iPads. So what I can do now is I can have six children dotted around the class with an iPad, having their screens mirrored to the board. And that for me is six times more interactive than interactive whiteboards. So things like that really. I've, I, I, this, the amount of schools I've gone into though and I've said that and they've gone, oh, are you joking? We've just bought new whiteboards. I'm like, why are you not having a discussion about it? Why are you not speaking to the staff and saying, what would you prefer, yeah. you know? Or seeking advice first. Do you, do you find sometimes where um, you're in a school and you give that advice and it's just a little bit too out there? Uh, sometimes, yeah. It de depends on the culture of the school really. Mm -hmm. um, I've, I've had quite a few run-ins with, because with, I, I do speak out about the current picture of education and where I think um, we're going wrong with it and, and that sort of, and we'll get onto that in a, in a bit, I'm sure. Um, so I've had some runnings because there are some head teachers that, you know, don't want to hear that they're not doing it right. Yeah, they don't want to hear what you've got to say even though yeah, you've got you into. Yeah. I come across a lot of amazing ones, by the way. Oh, yeah. Um, I'll tell you why I, I will always judge it in a school though, is if the head teacher sits in on the training. I've got this real bugbear with when I go to a school and the head teacher can't be bothered to sit. And I know they're busy and I know. So I if you think... book some training, get yourself yeah, yeah. there. You've got to sit in on it. No, just purely because a lot of what I say in my training and I talk about getting rid of marking policies, getting rid of all this faff and nonsense. If a head teacher hears that second hand, mm -hmm. that is scary. You know, if, and I've had it, I had, I had one school where um, the head teacher didn't sit in on the training and did the whole working smart and not harder stuff in the morning. And as we finished for lunch, someone had ran to her office and just said, he's saying not to mark anymore, which is not what I say. I'll just say there's more effective ways of giving feedback. So she came running down the corridor. And initially, naively, I thought she was coming to greet me as to say, look, I'm really sorry I couldn't be here this morning, but I've heard really good things, thank you very much. And she just bit me head off. I've never been spoken to like that before. It was, it was I was absolutely cacking it. did you even find it. out that you actually said that first? No, it's just Kate, just ranting at me, just, uh, how dare you come and tell my staff not to mark? Who do you think you are waltzing into my school telling my staff what to do? Um, Offset are going to come in for one day. Do you think they want to sit on an iPad for, for the day? And I felt like going, they don't really care what, what, what they want to do. If that's, it says in the framework, if that's what you choose to do. And she started the afternoon session with me stood next to her and the whole staff in front. And she went, uh, everything he said this morning, you're all going to ignore. And then walked off again. Yeah. So, yeah, I'm surprised she didn't send you home. You know what's interesting about the marking is um, we were in Serbia last week and we actually yeah. looked around the grammar school, so it was for 15 to 19 year olds. Um, but then we also made connections with, um, I think it's elementary school, but it's 8 to 14 or something like that, like 7 to 14. School, yeah. yeah, like yeah. a middle school. But they don't start official school till 7 anyway. Mm -hmm. And I was talking to her about marking because she doesn't really take any work home. I think she takes work home once a fortnight, and yeah. that's when they get so they get tested a lot. They get mm -hmm. tested every two weeks. So well, when when do you do all your marking? She went, "What are you talking about?" She doesn't mark the books. And I said, "Well, Is it a waste how, of time? how did they get any feedback?" And she's like, "Well, I just go around in the lesson and I talk to them, yeah. and I book like little interviews with them in the lesson. Yeah. And when Which every when when knows. it when yeah when it ends, I leave, and I'm like." Yeah. 
this is the kind of thing I did on supply to save me time. Yeah. And I used to look at the door every five minutes because so many times I had a teacher walk past and see me helicoptering and not sat with a group and complain to the agency. Yeah. And now we're it's, moving towards that. Yeah, we, we, we are, yeah. I think it's just letting go of that obsession with accountability. That's the biggest problem. And the, the thing with marking is you ask majority of teachers, m most teachers know that they're not marking for the kids. Yeah. They're marking so that when the books get checked, it shows that they've looked at it. And that's, that's pointless. It's yeah. a waste of time. The marking so. for Ofsted to come in, aren't they? Yeah, yeah. And for the head teacher to feel safe. Yeah, yeah. And the head teachers to have that accountability rather than trusting. Yeah. So Adele Marsh wants to know, how do you have time for a family and your various social media pages? Um, interesting. Uh, it's tough. It's tough. It's hard. It's not easy, but um, it's one of them. Like, I do enjoy it. I absolutely love it, and and it, I'm very passionate about it. So, with the social media stuff, it's almost become a bit more of a hobby. Yeah. So, like, um, getting it into your routine, I guess, as well. Yeah. So, you know, if I make a funny video, which you know, read one of the Mrs. May books or do one of the music videos, whatever. I know that it will get seen by so many other teachers and they'll comment on it and they'll tag their friends in it and I'll get a few messages saying, oh, I've had, you know, the amount of messages I'll receive are, it's, you know, I've had such a crap day at school and really fed up, blah, 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 but I've just watched that video and it's put a smile on my face. So it's, yeah. it's knowing that, you know, it connects us as teachers, it makes people feel like they've, they're not the only one and even if they're in a school where they don't get that support and it can be quite toxic and they feel isolated, they know that there's someone to reach out to and... You know, so it, it's, it's a bit more, the social media stuff's a bit more of a hobby. And I think what's nice about it, from my point of view, when I've watched it, is that it's not just a random teacher doing it. It's somebody who has had experience of being higher up in a school, who's yeah. saying what all the teachers are thinking, Yeah. sort of, from that point of view, because sometimes it can feel a bit like them and us, can it, in a yeah, school? Yeah. And it's just, uh, yeah, it's uh, doing it through, through humour, I suppose, so... Uh, Making the best of it. Yeah, yeah, and it, and it is tough. And like, um, I'm very lucky in that, you know, with the whole the, the other business side of things, me me wife handles all the admin of the bookings. Because when I first started off doing this, I was killing myself. Like, yeah. you know, I'd be doing part time in my school. I'd then be travelling down to wherever, yeah. um, getting to my hotel room nine ten at night, answering emails about booking, invoicing doing the training so it felt like I was just wearing too many hats and it was it was tough and then obviously the social media side so my wife has since taken over all the admin side and does all my booking on my invoice and she's the bad guy who has to chase the schools when they don't they don't pay because she's the nightmare uh, for not we paying. We also sell to schools. Yeah yeah but the, I, honestly you won't believe the amount of uh, school offices my wife phones and says oh this person was on a course with Mr P. Who? This person who's a teacher, and it's like you know, so she does all that we sort of stuff, and it, yeah, it frees it frees me up to to focus on the content and and the website and the training and that sort of stuff, and you know what I'm hoping for is I'm hoping for the website now to take off a little bit more so that I'm not on the road as much. So yeah. I think the biggest time-consuming thing that I do is is the travelling, and 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 don't get me wrong, when I get to a school wherever I go, I absolutely love doing the training, doing the CPD, it's just uh, being in the hotel room, travelling three, four hours, you know, a day. Being away from, and being away from the kids, children, it's, yeah. yeah, it's a killer. Yeah. So I'm hoping we can get a bit more of a balance with the website taking off a bit more. So that's the, that's the dream. Cool. Um, Sarah Clayton, there's so many questions. Sarah Clayton says, do you ever feel down about your job because you always seem so cheerful? <laughs> that's just what I show you through social media, see. It's a lesson to be learned this because... I always talk about on the training, you can't compare yourself to what you're saying. Like, now, don't get me wrong, I try and be as cheerful as possible. Yeah, so but it's I more definitely... brighter today than um, you were yesterday. Oh, that was because I've was, just woken up. Um, <laughs> so you phoned me when I, ju I just got home from IB for on the Monday and I was still sort of uh, tired. So when you phoned up, at, yeah, I was still in bed. So, um, so yeah, so I, I do have me down. you only got to speak to my wife about that. She'll tell you that I can be a right moaner. Um, and I do w worry. I worry about where education's going, and I worry about the funding, and I worry about the impact that's going to have on my own children's education, and obviously the business side of things. So it is, it is, I do worry about it. But what I would take from that is just to not think, you know, because I do sort of show a certain side of myself, but then I'm not going to go on Facebook and be like, oh, look how upset I am about this. And I suppose I do make certain videos about my my uh, worries, but I just try and do it in a bit more of a humorous way, I suppose. But um, 
yeah, you can't compare yourself to anyone you see online. That's what I always say to my kids at school and my own children is like comparison is a thief of joy. We, we're sort of spending so much time scrolling and sort of comparing ourselves. But what you're seeing is everyone's perfect sign. Yeah, you are. What they um, want to show. Yeah, yeah. And so we live in this filtered world now and we've got to teach children to see through that because it's having such a negative impact on body image issues and uh, mental health issues. And, you know, the key to fixing a lot of what I think uh, is happening at the minute is is education. So, you know, I did a lesson earlier on this year, my year fours, using one of those um, filtering apps. Mm -hmm. Can't remember what the name of it is. Face app or something like that. Not, no, like face app's the one. That, yeah, there's loads of body app or something. Um, anyway, took a selfie myself, edited it to the nth degree and showed the children and said, right, bit of like spot the difference, all the ways in which I've changed myself. And oh, So they could tell it was still you then? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. But it was a thinner, thinner version. Uh, I'd thin my nose out. It's all on the Facebook page anyway. And um, then the discussion went on to why people, so many people do it. And, and then the conversation led on to why people should probably stop doing it. And, and it was an amazing afternoon, uh, amazing lesson. Um, and I wasn't doing that with my year fours to encourage them to go home and start editing all the selfies, you know, like you need to, um, <laughs> you need to. Uh, no, uh, it was, it was it, teaching them to see through that because they're following all these bloggers, influencers, YouTubers, Instagrammers who do it on a daily basis and then try and sell them products through it. Yeah, so look, to question whether they were doing it yeah. or not. Yeah. Look, I've, I've, I've taken this milkshake and I've lost all this weight. No, you've taken a picture of yourself and you've photoshopped yeah, it. you can tell by the mirror. Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's getting children to see through that and get them clued up so then they don't fall into this trap of feeling, you know, that they're not good enough or that, you know. So, um, and it's interesting because with a lot of what I talk about with the tech now, it's about trying to find links to the wider curriculum. So we did that lesson off the back of an English lesson where we used um, Jess Glynn's Thursday, the song for reading comprehension. We spent a session looking at the lyrics, deconstructing the lyrics and the themes behind it. And then in the afternoon, we did this computing lesson linking to that. So it was amazing. And um, But yeah, if you go on my Facebook page, all the stuff for that's there. So Yeah, to have a go. Yeah. Thank you. Um, this question's from Mitch Hudson from Gramasaurus. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, so he wants to know what your daytime job is. So I, I guess he's asking, like, what do you do day to day? You know, what does your week look like? Uh, in, uh, so it will involve a lot of travelling. <laughs> um, so I, at the minute I'm booked uh, in schools. Um, I think I'm pretty much booked up at least till Christmas at the minute. Well, and head teacher I know said they're having training September 2020. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I was like, that's a long time away. She's like, yeah, that's the first one we could get. Yeah, yeah. Which is great, which is great, yeah. but frustrating because we get so many schools and we're like, we can't do that date. And yeah. so, um, yeah, can't clone myself, unfortunately. But um, so, but that's what the website hopefully will do is yes. or at least oh, no. tie them over until we can get a date. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so um, we'll do the first part of the week. I'll be in schools, usually running inset training. Um, CPD sessions for teachers. Uh, one of the training packages that I do now is this year group cluster. So what schools can do is they can cluster up with a, a group of local schools, book me in for seven days, and then we just do a year group focus each day. So schools don't close for inset. They and they also share teachers. the cost, do they as well? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So each school pays one day's inset, mm -hmm. but effectively the schools get access to seven days. Yeah. So that's become more and more popular with obviously budgets and stuff because it, you just get so much more out of that. One day's inset, you'll get, you know, four or five ideas or four or five apps that we'll look at. And I guess they don't necessarily need to pay for supply either if they can cover it. Well, yeah, just yeah. For, yeah, yeah, so... Because uh, what, what I'll get is I'll get, um, you know, inquiries for the first few days in September. Yeah, uh, everyone you know, a couple of them. days. Yeah, everyone wants them. And, Not you know, Easter. yeah, yeah. So it's a way in which schools can have the training yeah. to where, whenever throughout the year. Uh, without having to worry about, oh, we've got to close the school down. And it's nice because we'll end up with a group of, say, 15 year six teachers. And then the conversations, you know, will go beyond the tech and we'll talk. And it's, it's a really nice way. Because yeah. teachers need to network. They just don't Absolutely, have any yeah, time yeah. to do that. Yeah, so yeah. that's that's really good. Yeah. Like that. And so this, when I'm doing my moan about marking and stuff, we'll get the dialogue going. Well, what do you do? What do you do? What do you, you know? And yeah, so it's yeah. nice. And yeah, so that, that, that works really well. And, um, and then it'll be in my school on on uh, towards the uh, end of the week and yeah it's good I love I love being at my school I mean they don't buy into the whole Mr PICT stuff at all so it keeps me very grounded the kids don't either so we went to the residential just before summer and um, obviously there's a few other schools there and the teachers sort of came over or no a kid came over and said there uh, my, my, my teacher wants a selfie with you <laughs> and so I went over and then all my kids are like why would anyone 
what a selfie with you. And I'm like, I don't know. So, yeah, they keep me very grounded. And uh, it's great because I've got that sort of freedom at the minute in my school where, you know, I work with a year group. I'll work with the year group in the morning, year group in the afternoon, and I'll just uh, speak to the teachers and say, what have you been up to? What have you been doing? Uh, oh, we've written these non-chronological reports about you know, Romans, and I'll say, right, well, what we'll do is we'll do some green screening. We'll get them to bring it to life. We'll get yeah, them, you yeah. Know, or so you get to teacher. do all the amazing fun stuff that I would like to do as well. Yeah, yeah, I do. But, you know, and some some teachers prefer it because they don't feel as confident. Other teachers will do it themselves and then I'll do maybe a bit more coding sort of thing. So, um, but yeah, it's, I like that freedom of being able to, to, to go in and say, right, well, I've seen this new app actually and I want to give this a go. So let's see how we can use it to do this with ancient Greece or whatever it might be. So, um, yeah, I'm quite lucky in that way. Uh, because, you know, I come across a lot of schools that are so strict and, and rigid with what they do and how they do it that you don't have that flexibility. And I think it's a shame, really, because you give teachers that trust, that autonomy, and they're just naturally creative. And I think that's the one thing that's being beaten out of teachers is they're not, they're not given time to think themselves. And, you know, a lot of the stuff that I talk about in my training, a lot of teachers could do it themselves. They're just not given the, yeah. the time and the trust, really, which is a shame. And I think, for me, the key theme that's coming through from a lot of people that I've interviewed recently mm. is that people who have managed to make a success out of something slightly different or something to help other teachers is because the leaders let them. Yeah, yeah. They were, you know, helpful, they let them try things, they let them go off and do things, you know. Mitch Hudson said the same, Mr Hunt yesterday said the same, you're saying the same. So that's what you need to do if you want if you want to grow. Read Simon Sinek's book about leadership. I think I think what what I find now is that in a lot of schools you either have your leaders or you have your bosses. Yeah. I think everyone goes into leadership with the right intention. They want to be a great leader. And I don't know whether it's the pressure of the job and you know because it's so tough being a head teacher at, at the minute right. and it is so hard. Um, but I, you've, you've, you can't put that pressure and put the finger pointing at your teachers because all they do then is point at the kids and you've just got this toxic culture happening. I think the biggest difference between a boss and a leader is is empathy. And, and if teachers, because I think now the role of a head teacher isn't uh, to look after the kids. I did this conference down in uh, Dorset, I think, and I did a head teachers conference and uh, it was brilliant because they do it as like a weekend and they go, they have a right big booze up the night before and yeah, then they have yeah, the conference. Right. Yeah, yeah. So I had them all hung over and I was sort of hammering us, if you're doing this, you're doing this, you're doing it wrong. But I just said like, what's your role as a head teacher? And nine times out of 10, they'll say, oh, it's about looking after the kids. It's like, it's not. It's not anymore. Most of the head teachers don't even see the children, no, do they? No. Because they're so busy with everything else. I'm not saying that's right or wrong. That's just the way the job's evolved. Their role now is to look after the people who look after the kids. Yeah. And if they can create the culture where teachers feel valued, appreciated, th th everything else takes care of, you know, the, yeah. it takes care of itself. So, you know, a person who feels appreciated will always do more than is expected. Yeah. And if you can create that culture, that's half the battle. Yeah. I completely agree. It's kind of like the same rant that I have about life work balance. You know, mm -hmm. it's not, it isn't just about the children, it's about the teachers as well. And that's all. It's funny because I always say it as work life balance. Have you purposely gone life work yes. because life comes because first? Because life comes first. Interesting. Yeah, yeah. Wow. yeah with capital letters, we have yeah. life work balance. Yeah, yeah we change it around. Um, right, last one before we uh, see if there's any questions. Yeah, just, no on, just on this live. Um, so, Amy Ahern, I hope I'm saying that right, might not be. Um, is there a computing screen? Uh, computing scheme that you would recommend? Um, so there, there's a couple of resources. I don't, um, I don't think there's a particular scheme that I think covers everything and is, is spot on. I think, the, I, I'm not a big fan of schemes. Uh, no, I don't mind schemes. I just don't, I just don't want them, I want it's teachers so to, yeah, 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 yeah. So Teachers need to have school. choice, don't yeah. they? They need to be able to put their own things in, otherwise That's they're not I mean. being a good yeah, teacher. Yeah, yeah, yeah. so yeah. Um, barefoot computing, uh, I do quite a lot of work with a guy called John Chippendall, who's, uh, again, part-time class teacher and does a lot of work for Barefoot, wrote a lot of the Barefoot resources, uh, works for a couple of unis doing the computing stuff there. So um, we do a lot of conferences together where he does the computer science stuff and I do the IT across the curriculum. So the stuff on Barefoot's brilliant for computer science. Um, Obviously, the, the MrPICT.com will have a lot of stuff for the cross-curricular. Uh, Codeit.co.uk, OurCode, Code.org is, is, is good as well. Uh, Digital-literacy.co.uk has a good um, 
e-safety website, national online safety. There's, there's a few, uh, but they tend because what's interesting about the computing curriculum is it actually breaks down into three parts. You've got your computer science, which is your coding, your programming. So barefoot for for that w w is a good resource. Then you've got your IT, which is what I would say my stuff probably links best to. Yeah. And then you've got your digital literacy, which show your e-safety, online safety. So there's quite a few resources for that. Like I say, digital literacy co.uk um uh, what's the other one national online safety is another good one uh yeah 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 there's a few there so uh, i don't think anyone quite yet has got the scheme that covers everything um but like i say you want to be you for me when it comes to because when we teach computing in our school now and we have a um, computer site computing lesson we will focus that hour or so on the computer science, and we'll do your coding, computational thinking, um, programming. The actual IT and uh, digital literacy stuff, we've taken out the computing curriculum and embedded across the rest of yes, the curriculum. which makes so much more sense. Yeah, yeah, so that's where... Doing it for a purpose. Yeah, yeah, and using the technology to allow children to, to present what they've learned and show their understanding in creative ways, and then also being pub publishing that on our school's social media pages, so we're, we're then demonstrating how to be a positive, responsible digital citizen in a, pur a purposeful way, rather than just you know waiting for Internet Safety Day and saying, right, come on, we'll make a make a poster about because that doesn't do anything. So you know, yeah. it's about day in yeah. day. We don't do Internet Safety Day in our school because every day is Internet Safety Day. You know, so yeah. uh, it's about trying to embed that in everything that we do. So um, so yeah, so a few few ideas, there, a few resources there. Clara Bell says, recently heard about a school that has introduced gaming on the official curriculum. What's your take on this? Um, depends what game it is, I suppose. Um, I think there is a place, I think there's, there's the, when I first started, we did a massive project on looking at video games. And the, um, so we did uh, Angry Birds as a topic, we did Temple Run as a topic, you know, and you could use it in maths because once they get a score, mm -hmm. We do it as a little mental oral starter where the children would play a game of Angry Birds maybe on the screen and then we'd use the score and we'd do a bit of work around that. Um, same with like Fruit Ninja and Temple Run. Temple Run was great. We did a load of writing around Temple Run as well. So again, it's all on my blog. Um, then we, we, we did quite a bit of work with Minecraft. I think Minecraft's such a powerful tool because I don't necessarily see it as much of a game. There's a gaming element to it, but there's the creation side of things so uh, we've done loads of work in Minecraft where the children can go in create their own world and just build things so we built Egyptian pyramids we built Tudor houses we built rivers and you know again it's about them applying that knowledge of saying right well what features of a river can we put into this little build you know what we're building there and yeah. Um, and trial and error, I guess, as well. As yeah, yeah, there's a lot. Yeah, yeah. So, um, but with everything, it's about it's about balance, I suppose. It, uh, it probably has a place. It's just making sure it's not overly used, I suppose. So, yeah, it'd be interesting. If you can put the link to what school it is, I'd like to read a bit more about it, if, okay. if possible. Clara Bell, that's for you. We need to uh, yeah, yeah. put a link into your school. Um, I'm just, I'm not going to read them all out. Um, Nicola says, what's a must-have in your classroom? A must-have? Um, personally, if the money was that, I, I think enough enough iPads. I think there's so much you can do with that. Um, a must have uh, TA. Yeah. yeah. That's a must have. I don't know what I'd do if I didn't have a TA. I've got to be honest with you. Especially because people um, can take it away. Yeah, yeah, and and I think that that's the most important resource uh, for schools. And to see so many schools now having to cut back is shocking. Absolutely shocking. So. Yeah, that my must-have would be, uh, yeah, TA. Just for someone to talk to and just... Yeah, do you, know, do you know one thing that I used to love about it was like the... Um, I don't know how to explain it, but, you know, the um, kind of like coded conversations yeah, you yeah. could have with your TA across the classroom that the children... The odd child in year six might kind of get it and it was always yeah, yeah. very humorous. You'd have one um, class, but I just kind of love that banter. Yeah. I mean, I had, I had a TA for my first couple of years and she was just unbelievable. She was... I, I wouldn't have made it through without her. She'd been at the school for years and um, I started in year five and then there was another teacher who started at the Christmas as an NQT. So we were two you know, NQTs in year five and she just got us through those first couple of years. She was amazing. So yeah, TA is the yeah. backbone of every school. And they keep your sanity. Absolutely. Like you say. Um, I'm just reading through and thinking, oh, there's so many questions. Um, right, I'm just going to try to skip through them. Um, what's the one thing within the education system that you disagree with? That's from Tom Fox. Oh, one? <laughs> yeah. If you had to pick one. This government. There you go, Facebook. You can have that one. 
the oh, one uh, just the accountability in schools. Mm. If you take that away, every, I think everything else would fall in place. But I think it's a bit wider society issue though. I think we live in this. We're, we're in a country that is so conditioned to blame other people for everything. Yes. We just blame it, you know. So, yeah. and it, I link link it with technology in a bit, but you know. It's this blame culture. It's like, you know how we always compare ourselves to other countries and it's, you know, we'll go over to Singapore and see what they're doing in maths and we're like, well, bring that back. You can't no. because the whole culture around education is completely different. And do you know what's really funny about that? I just sort of mentioned earlier that we're in Serbia and they said to us, oh, your education system is really good. And I'm like, <laughs> oh, really? Because we keep tell being told yeah, it's rubbish and yeah. it's really good everywhere else. Yeah, it's interesting. And they were so confused. I've done quite a bit of work with international schools and a lot of international schools will use the English curriculum and I think if you've got a choice of all, every curriculum, every year, every country, why would you go for the... I don't mind some of the in curriculum, I think a lot of it's not fit for purpose, but, you know, we do some great stuff, we do, but you're never going to be able to change that accountability system in education with the society that we live in at the minute. Yeah. So you look at like Finland, it's Finland's awesome, always yeah, put on a pedestal. Well. But teachers in Finland are treated like doctors yeah, and they're treated and like... it's the same in Japan as well. Yeah, so that's never going to happen in this country. Yeah. So you're never going to be able to change that whole culture around schools and the accountability, and, um, which is what needs to happen. Mm -hmm. it, but it's a society issue. I think, you know, it's, it's kind of believed, isn't it, that sometimes the teachers are serving the parents? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and you've got to look at a lot of parents now have been through this schooling system where it failed them anyway. Yeah. So they don't believe in it. And you could you could look at you probably look at third fourth generation of that now. So, yeah, it's very difficult. It's kind it's of tough. very. I don't think it's an impossible question. Mm. I mean, this, but at the same time, the accountability within a school shouldn't be as bad as it is in certain yeah. schools. So obviously, we, you're always going to have that accountability with league tables because education is a political ball game, and you know they use it whenever they need to, and and you know. Uh, and there's that side of things. So you can never fully escape it, the whole Ofsted stuff. But within a school, you could create the culture where that accountability is kept to the bare minimum. Yeah. So because you're trusting the teachers and you, you're creating the culture where teachers feel like they're part of a team building something great and their opinions valued. And, you know, whereas the opposite end, if you go for the results driven, then it's like the military. You're doing this, you're doing it this way. There's no discussion about yeah. it. And yeah. yeah. Um, Hayley Dawson says, how many hours a week do you think teachers should actually be working? I probably do 70 hours a week and I know I'm not alone in that. Depends on what you're doing with the hours. So I'd, 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 I think there's quite a lot of teachers who, work, who don't mind working hard and we don't mind putting a few extra hours in if we know the hours that we're putting in is having a direct impact on the children. My issue at the minute is there's too many schools where teachers are forced to spend all this time doing faff. Marking. No, no, yeah. yeah. Not, do, well, not, not you could, you, there's a few, marking, planning, uh, observations, um, just the, the whole accountability stuff, displays at the summer, mm -hmm. right? If you're a teacher that loves doing a display, I'm not, you know, because this is the thing, you get a lot of teachers, I class them as like busy teachers, and there's nothing, I've got nothing against them. If that's what they want to do with the time, that's fine. And actually, some of and them... And nobody should tell them not to do it, right? Because sometimes on Facebook, they do, don't they? Yeah. Why are you working? Yeah, yeah. Scroll past, mute the group during summer if you don't, don't want to see it. But um, it's when it's forced, because, you know, displays add very little to children's learning, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, and it's down to the teacher. But you've got schools who have display policies. Yes. And I've been told about head teachers who walk into a teacher's room, pulls down a display in front of the kids so because... Nice. The, 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 the staples aren't vertical or horizontal. Or, or it's know, the wrong so. colour. Yeah, yeah. So we've talked a lot about getting technology into schools. And my, my thoughts are, sometimes I know that there might be um, head teachers or leadership that are just against it. Have you got any tips for uh, teachers helping to persuade leadership to get on board with it? Um, so what I, I get a lot of questions like that on my, my courses. And what I always say is maybe... Try so you know try a couple of the ideas out for your class, and if you see that that's had an impact, you've then got the evidence to say to the SLT. And the thing is, I think with a lot of a lot of the technology, because how we use technology outside of school has made our life so convenient in lots of ways. We're very impatient. We're very very impatient as a society, and it creeps into schools in that we've got to see instant instant impact from absolutely everything. And so, um, you know, 
we've got to implement this program so quickly so we get results at the end of this year. And this is where I think, again, a lot of the curriculum stuff's going to fall down because if you take Ofsted's whole guidance of um, what they're saying about the curriculum and you sit there and as a staff you develop this curriculum for your school, for your pupils and your context, you're not going to see impact from that for four or five years. Yes. You get inspected in two and it doesn't matter what you're doing. And we're still, try, you know, we're still trying to catch up anyway. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So with technology, I always say it's not an overnight thing. And, um, you know, we're, what, seven years into having iPads now? And we're still way off the finished product as a school. Mm -hmm. But I know we're moving in the right direction. Mm -hmm. So it's just, you know, I'm quite impatient with it. But I know that we've got to just give teachers time. Because it does take teachers time. I mean... I mean. And how, how often are you replacing? Are you replacing on cycle your iPads? Uh, uh, um, yeah, so we've just replaced the first set we had with a new set. And then we've probably got another two, three years before the Do next lot. Um, we have done. So most of them are minis. And then the, we've just got a new set. We've got a new 30, which are the, the iPad, uh, which are were for schools, the ones that Apple made for schools. So, um, yeah, I think I think the biggest obstacle in a lot of schools with, with the technology is, is leadership. And it's, it's interesting because my head teacher is not confident with it at all but he trusts in people who are. So, you know, when I first approached him about Twitter and Facebook, he sort of was a bit like, mm, I'm not sure about that. I'm not, I don't, I don't know if we can have this face tube. That's what he called it, face tube. And, um, and, you know, and he was a bit, and I said, well, look, look at this way. If we can get as many parents engaged, we probably won't have to send out as many letters and it'll save yeah. us money. And it was like, right, all right. So what he's great at is, 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 is trusting in staff who are passionate about something and he gives them that opportunity to try it out. And if it doesn't work, it doesn't, doesn't work. But, um, you know, the You're social media stuff's been, it. yeah, yeah, it's been, been incredible. And it has saved our school loads of money and it's engaged our, low, our media school community, but also connected our classroom with the world. So, you know, uh, Sports Day, my role on Sports Day now is I set up the cameras and we stream it live on Facebook. Yeah. So if parents can't be there in person, don't worry, log on to Facebook, you've got a live stream. And you'll be able to see it later if you Yeah, yeah, and then the kids can go home and say, I won this race, let's watch it on Facebook together. And then when you get in, you know, we do it with some of our, um, we've done it with some of our Christmas shows and our assemblies. And it's great then because with the whole GDPR stuff, um, as long as we've got permission, then we're fine to film that. And it's not, you know, you can't say to all the parents, you know, and I've been to my own kids where it's like, you can't take pictures, you can't do that because of GDPR. So this is, is the perfect, you know, look, tag your grandparents, wherever they are in the world, and they're able to feel part of it, feel part of the school community. So, uh, and then in the same breath then, we're just demonstrating to the pupils all the time, positive use of social media. So um, going back to the question about leadership, <laughs> it, it, yeah, it's just, it's just trying to get uh, leaders to see the, the, the positives and, and the impact it can have even though it's not going to be an overnight thing, but that is the biggest obstacle. And it's got to be leadership letting go again of this accountability. So one of the big talking points for me now on a lot of my training is this, got to get, get away with this obsession with the book scrutinies. Mm. And a lot of schools, it's all about the book. It's all about the book. And that creates so many problems. Sometimes they do one per week on a different subject. Oh, it's ridiculous. Yeah. Because what you then do is you create this mentality in teachers where they think it's all about the book. So you narrow your curriculum massively. And fear. Uh, yeah, I'm fit. And, and, and then it's all about, because I was in a school the other week where the head teacher said, you know, they were looking through books and the teacher had done 16 consecutive lessons, which were like photocopyable worksheets from I think Twinkle or wherever it was. And it's like, and they're only doing that because they think they've got to get so many pages filled in the book. And I'm not against worksheets. Worksheets have a place, but why not? Are you given the opportunity to then yeah. utilize the technology as well? So it's finding that sort of balance with it. So I always say now, scrap the book scrutiny stuff, because I hate the word scrutiny anyway. Uh, and don't call them book looks, because that winds me up how you've got to make everything rhyme in education. Do you know what I mean? You can hoodwink any, any teacher if you make something rhyme or use any sort of alliteration. Teacher like, this sounds so nice. Get it in the policy. <laughs> it winds me up. So um, learning reviews, call them learning reviews. So what we do in our school is when we have a learning review, we'll take some of our books because our books are important. But then we also take the iPads because we use a, a tool on the iPads that I know we've sort of talked about apps and stuff. My one app that I would recommend every school using is Seesaw. Mm -hmm. uh, it's absolutely free. Plenty of tutorials on mrpict.com if you need them, but it's so easy to use. Um, that's by far the biggest impact on workload in our school because 
what we what effectively what it is is it's a digital exercise book for mm -hmm. the kids so the children can log in by scanning a QR code and they can then evidence their learning in Seesaw. And so um, obviously you've got your books for certain tasks, but they can make videos, they can add in all the stuff they've made on the iPads, they can do all these things. And so you can share stuff as well. So if I wanted um, uh, you know, a chapter from a book, I can take the pictures, put it in Seesaw, the pupils can access the text, yeah, yeah. and therefore I'm not wasting half an hour at the photocopier every morning. So I'm saving myself time. Um, photocopying and also, I love, I love that because it's good for the environment. Oh, absolutely, yeah. So it's just a win-win, because it? it's sa and it saves the school money, it saves the teacher time, and it's good for the environment. And you can do that with, you know, SATS papers. You don't have to print every SATS paper out. But then it's also this idea that the children then learn into evidence they're, lo they're learning online, um, which is, again, embedding all the digital literacy skills and... Uh, every time we do that, we're talking about children. Every time you put something on Seesaw, it's stored online. Every time you put something online, it's there forever. So it's getting them to understand that. So when they're old enough to use other apps, they're aware of when they do post something online. And it's just um, it's just incredible. The impact has just been amazing because the children lead it all. So it's not, you know, this is where we, t how many iPads would you want in a class? If you can just get one iPad on a table, so let's say you've got six tables, six iPads, you're away because you've got, a dictionary, a thesaurus, and then you've got that opportunity to, for children to evidence their learning independently without you panicking, I've got to get this worksheet in the book, I've got to somehow, you know, because you get teachers who, I'll tell you where it was, where we decided to go with Seesaw, is I was team teacher with a year one teacher, and I got into school about quarter to eight, I think, and she'd already been in for about an hour, because she was sat there writing learning challenges out for all the children for this math lesson that they were doing, which is another bugbear of mine. So any school that are doing learning challenges, stop it, because it's a complete and utter waste of time. Um, are you doing it for, the kids know what they're doing, because you put it on the board, why do they need to then waste five minutes copying, you, you know, yeah. but, uh, you know, oh, it's for Ofsted, they'll know what we're doing. Well, if they want to know what we're doing, come and talk to me and I'll tell them. Yeah. But anyway, so, um, uh, so she was handwriting them out because they were year one, they couldn't do it themselves. And then when it came to math lesson, they didn't do anything in the books anyway. They were um, making number sentences with Numicon and it was a cracking little lesson. But she was, I don't know how many coffees she'd had that morning because she was wired. She was running around the classroom, just pictures, pictures upon pictures of the children doing this activity. Spent a whole break time getting all the pictures from her iPad to a computer. Then went into phonics, into English, got to lunch. Have an hour, we have an hour for lunch. She didn't, she had about five minutes because she spent all the lunch time getting the pictures from her computer down to the printer, getting them all printed out, photocopied, trimming them down. And the TA spent all afternoon sticking them in the books. And I'm going, why? And that's become, that became so routine for the teachers. They didn't even realise how much time that wasted. Yeah. So I was what like, was the point the of doing that something fixed. that was practical? Yeah, that, that's something we need to fix, hence why we introduced Seesaw. And that was us three years ago. Luckily, we've moved on a lot since then. There are still a lot of schools who are doing that day in, day out. I know there is, yeah. I had a school contact me with a GoFundMe page for TAs a while back, because obviously budgets and stuff, so they're trying to raise money to keep the TAs. And I sort of said, yeah, I'll share it, but just out of interest, find out what your photocopying bill is a year. And it was like near 30 grand. And I'm going, well, there's the issue. Yeah. You know, I'm not justifying the funding because it's criminal what this government are doing with education. Um, and the, the impact it's going to have in the next generation if it continues is, is, is uh, shocking. But there are ways in which teacher, schools need to be a lot more efficient. Mm -hmm. And that can be done through the tech. Mm -hmm. And so if you invest in it, what you've got to focus on first of all, any leadership, if you're listening to this and you're thinking, right, we're going to invest, is don't worry about the kids straight away. What I'd recommend schools do, if you're looking at iPads, for example, is buy every class teacher an iPad or every staff member an iPad. And just for that first year, just solely focus on getting teachers to use that iPad to make their life easier. Yeah. So how can it help me with my planning? How can it help me uh, mirror it to the board and we can do some science investigation? You know, um, it can be a visualizer, that sort of thing. How can I evidence certain work, a bit of the work through Seesaw? And then once the teachers see that this technology is now saving them time, mm -hmm. they're going to be a lot more open to using it with the pupils. Yeah. But what tends to happen is it becomes an extra thing you've got to do on, every, on top of everything else. Yeah. So you wheel the iPads Nothing's in. Taken away. Yeah. So you need to use these iPads now. Mm -hmm. What? On top of all the planning, teaching, assessment, tracking, data, learning walks, observations, book scrutinies, ridiculously pointless marking policies. You're now telling me I've got to use this. Well, and that's why it fails. Mm -hmm. So this is why my training has evolved quite a lot over the past few years from 
when it first started off, it was like, this is all the ways in which technology can creatively enhance the curriculum, whereas now it's sort of half of that and then half of, well, actually, we've got to create this culture first yes. for you to be able to have the time to develop the understanding of this. Yeah. So that's why, you know, I will speak out about um, the obsession with the accountability and all the faff and the nonsense. And Because I did a conference down in Wales recently. I did an NQT conference in um, Cardiff. It was at Cardiff City Stadium. And the, um, the Minister of Education in Wales spoke before I did. So she was up there. And, and it's interesting because the Wales curriculum really, really... Uh, forward thinking and they're really moving it forward. Uh, I was quite jealous actually listening to what they were saying because um, they're really valuing this a lot more. And so uh, one question was asked, you know, what are you, what are you going to do about workload and that sort of thing? And she said, uh, well, there's not just one answer to the workload issue. And then I got up after and went, there is. It's just stop the faff. Stop the faff, stop the nonsense. If it doesn't have a direct impact on the kids learning, stop doing it. Who are you doing it for? And, you know, there's so much we can stop doing to free up the time. Um, and leadership is to blame, in certain schools are to blame, but then you've, at, the, at the same time, you've got the teachers as well. Yeah. So teachers have to be open to, to changing. And, yes. you know, so I've been in schools where the leadership team are like, I've been saying this for years. I've been saying we've got to stop marking. I've got rid of the marking policy. I don't expect them to do it, yet they're still getting five highlighters out. And, I, and they're moaning about it. So you get teachers who, who can be, you know, martyrs. I've you know, yeah, got a couple, couple in my school, I'm not afraid to say, and they'll say to me, you know, two things I hate about my job, Lee. Two things. Number one, I hate the way things are. I'm like, yeah, so what do I. What does that mean? <laughs> so I hate the way things are. Uh, what's the second thing? I hate change. I'm like, oh, God. Which well, part can you do? And things are changing so fast now. Yeah. It's almost like, I don't know, because um, obviously you've got a business as well, if you've mm -hmm. heard of the stop, um, keep, start. Um, thing that you can try in your business. It's right. like they need to do that in school. Like, mm. you know, have a review every year. What do we need to stop? What do we need to keep? And what do we need to start? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah absolutely. This, it, but it's making the teachers feel part of it as well. Yeah. And I think sometimes it can be left... And Mitch Hudson said that. He said he got them on board. Yeah. And that was really helpful because then they bought into it more as well. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. they feel part of it. They feel part that the you know, it's not just a job, but they're, they're part of something bigger. Okay. Um... So lots of children tell their teachers that they want to be YouTubers. Mm -hmm. um, so what would you say to a child that says that they want to be a YouTuber? Yeah, I mean, so many kids in our school, that, that, that's what they talk about all the time because, you know, they're following so many of them. And, um, but it's actually a, legi a legitimate job now. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. What's interesting, though, recently, one of the big YouTubers have come out now and said that actually he's spending more money than he's making. So I think it's sort of on the decline a little bit. Um, I think vlogging's, I mean, YouTube aside, I think vlogging's amazing. I think vlogging is such uh, a powerful tool now in this rich visual and digital world that we live in. Everyone can have a voice, everyone can have a platform and yeah. you know, whatever your passion is, you've got the opportunity to utilize this, this, this platform, this, the internet to make share and it, you, know, yeah. you share what you know. Uh, I think vlogging is such a powerful tool and we don't utilize it enough. And, what a lot of teachers will again say, well, if we're vlogging, we're not writing. Well, no, they go hand in hand. So I had this year six child say to me a few years back, he said, uh, Miss P, I found your YouTube channel online last night. I said, all right. He said, yeah, I've seen you've got like 70 subscribers. So I was like, oh, why? Is that good? And he went, uh, it's not great, but I've only got three. So can you tell me how I can get more subscribers? So I sort of talked through the safety, how he's not old enough to be on there. And, you know, mm -hmm. and I said, right, well, talk me through how you make your videos then. He says, what I do is I get the camera. I press record and I just start talking. I said, well, there's the biggest mistake you make because all these big YouTube stars, all these big vloggers won't do that. The first thing that they'll do is they'll sit down, they'll write a script, they'll plan out what they're then going to perform. This is why children writing is so incredibly important in school because it is the starting point to absolutely everything. You know, every media you engage with will start with a written story, a written script. Um, Ed Sheeran wants an idea for a new song, he'll write it down, you know, um, Computer games will have a team of people sat around sketching out what's going to happen on this level. This, yeah. You know, you look at the biggest film franchise, whether it's Harry Potter, Lord of the Rings, whether it's Marvel, they all started as comics, books, and so yeah, on. Yeah. You know, my wife's, yeah, written text. So written text is still, still so important, so integral. It's just that you're getting more engagement, I suppose, in the, the visual side of what yeah. comes from it, you know. Uh, but that can be utilised in school. Yeah. So... Um, Writing is so incredibly important, but 
we can now use a technology to go a step further with the writing. And that's what I encourage schools and teachers to do all the time on my training. So I also write a resource called Read, Write, Perform, readwriteperform.com alongside a guy called John Murray who focuses a lot on reading. Brilliant, absolutely. One of the best insets I've ever had from for reading. Um, and um, yeah, he's, he's amazing. I've been lucky to work, work with him. We've developed this resource. So it sort of takes the traditional idea of, you know, you read examples of texts, uh, not just one, you get a, a, ver you know, a variety of texts with a similar purpose, similar sort of genre maybe. Um, and you, you deconstruct them, so it's sort of reading for a purpose to inform the writing, and then you do the writing, but then we use the technology to perform it. Mm -hmm. So we bring it to life, we might make a film, we might make a documentary, we might make uh, you know, a whole range of different genres. And the impact from that has been absolutely incredible. And we've, we've seen it firsthand how technology is just giving children such a purpose. Yeah. Um, because if you think about it, what we, what we still do at the minute in a lot of schools is you, you, you four weeks of persuasion, three weeks in, it's like, right, guys, we've been working for three weeks. Today's the day. We're going to do our big write. So, you know, this best be the best piece of writing you've ever done in your life. And you know me in business because I've lit a candle and I put Mozart on. And it's like, right, do your best piece. And the children, what's, why? Persuade people to buy some sellotape. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> why? What, what, what's the, why, why am I, well, I'm going to assess it. That's why. And this is what annoys me. Assessment should never be the driving force behind what we do in schools. Mm -hmm. Assessment should always be the byproduct of effective and engaging teaching. Mm -hmm. um, and so if it can be, well, we're going to do this writing because you're then going to perform it as a mm -hmm. green screen video and we're going to tweet that to a cert, cert, such a person. That suddenly gives them that purpose, that audience. Yeah, yeah. And they're going to want that writing the best, best it can possibly be. And then they've got the opportunity to bring it to life. And they are going process. to do better work, aren't they? Because they're going to be engaged in it. They're going to be interested. They've got a purpose. It's writing for a purpose. It's, it's, and, and, and that's the thing, everything's got to be purposeful. And I think that's where technology can really be powerful in that it gives children that purpose. It opens the door for their work to be seen and valued and, and, and seen by the world. But then they're also getting the opportunity to bring it to life, to create their own films, to create their own. So, um, so yeah, so it, it, utilize, if they want to be YouTubers, say, right. First thing we've got to be is we've got to be good readers so we can be good writers so we can then perform. It's like you, you've taken notes from uh, or prepared notes there. So even though this might seem like a bit of a, yeah. you know, open discussion, we've obviously done a little bit of planning into it. Yeah. To, so yeah. it's like that with everything. So um, so it's just giving that ch the children that real world experience of it. Really. Yeah, that you have to write first. Yeah. yeah. I'm going to ask you some quick fire questions in a minute. Mm -hmm. um, but I thought you might just like to tell everyone about your podcast first, seeing as we are oh, on yeah, a podcast. Yeah. yeah so I've uh, been doing a podcast with my brother who is a HLTA in a school in Manchester as well. So we um, it was in, we just sort of, I can't remember how we started. I think we, were, we did the big Florida holiday last year, last April. And we sort of sat in the hot, hot tub after a long day at Epcot, wherever it was. And we were sort of just sharing funny stories about what's happened in the school. And I sort of said, you know what, we should record this and just put it out as a podcast. Because I listen to loads of podcasts because I'm traveling all the time. And, you know, I've, I've, um, I'm really into my true crime stuff, uh, a couple of comedy ones. And um, so, yeah, so we just sort of did it and it's been amazing. So we, we've been doing it now for, well, it, we're just about to start the third season. Um, so it would be two years in April and we did a live show in April this year. So we did, we had sort of 120 teachers, I think, come to a, well, they weren't all teachers, but 120 people came to uh to a venue near us and we did a, a live show and that was just incredible, it was amazing. Uh, we've got a few more live shows coming up in, we've got one in Newport but that's sold out. We've got one in Newcastle and one in London. In Newcastle's in October, London's in November. And it's not, it's, it's in the educational category because we talk about school stuff but it's not, you're not gonna learn much. It's more of, um, it's more of a sort of, uh, just funny stories from the classroom. A bit like my Facebook page, it's just universe. Yeah, it's just sort of, look, listen to it, switch off a little bit. And we've had so many messages from teachers who say when they're doing the marking, they'll listen to it because it helps them get through. We've had teachers say that they fell off the treadmill laughing, so for legal reasons, we're not we're not responsible for that. Um, but yeah, it's just, it's, it's, it, for me, it's great for, I say this on my train all the time, like the whole wellbeing uh, initiative in schools now can wind me up a lot. Like. Um, Adding time, is that what you're thinking? Why are no, you adding no, time? No, with the wellbeing stuff, it's an interesting one because um, it's directly linked to workload. Mm -hmm. 
Like the reason, and, and the workload is the issue where we've got the retention crisis in teaching. You know, the government will go on about recruitment. Not it's the not, fact that we're not it's re- doing yoga. Yeah, yeah. Oh, don't get me started. It's about retention. The reason that so many teachers are leaving the profession is because of workload. And workload is directly linked to well-being. And the reason, and because so many schools aren't sorting the workload stuff out, the well-being stuff has now just turned into this token gesture thing. And it's like, uh, you might get a teacher who leaves a mug with a few chocolates in there, sticks it on your desk with a little post-it note saying you've been mugged. Pay it forward. What, what's that going to do for me? What you do? What you do? For one, I'm on a diet, so that's not going to help. And number two, how's that going to help me when I'm sat here for three hours every night, highlighting five different colours, knowing that my kids the next day can't even read it? That's not going to do anything. And, and the, the whole yoga stuff, like anyone ever told me how to do a yoga session, I'd slap him in the face because it's so... The thing with well-being is staying at school an extra hour. Yeah, yeah, it's so subjective well-being. It's so, and I know this. There'll be people listening to this, and they love a bit of yoga, and you know, fair play. I'm not. You know, I, I, no, I'm 100 percent with you. It's, it's just subjective. extra stuff. It's subjective. So what works for me isn't like I say. The podcast for me is brilliant for my well-being. I have my brother there, and I just laugh at him for an hour. Therapy. Yeah, I can't turn to you and go. Do you know what you need to do for your life-work balance? You need to do a podcast with your brother. Why are you not doing a podcast with your brother? You might not even have a brother, or your brother might not even be that funny. So I can't assume what I do, you know, because for some teachers, going to the gym, doing yoga is going to be brilliant for their, well, their well-being. Others might want to just crash out on a couch, get a bag of Doritos and binge on a series of Netflix. The job. only universal way in which we improve teachers' well-being is to give them time. Yes. And the only way you can give teachers time is to stop the faff, stop the nonsense. And maybe they don't want to do a yoga, even if they like yoga, maybe they don't want to do it with the colleagues. Yeah, 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 maybe yeah. they actually want to speak to people yeah. who don't teach. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah, go to the pub, do the pub quiz. I feel like we've already touched on this question, but I'm going to ask it you now. So if you could wave a magic wand, mm-hmm. how would you solve the life-work balance problem? Uh, just just take away that accountability and take just stop the faff in school. So stop, you know, I, I, I made a video a while back where it was five things that we need to get rid of. Um, marking policies, book scrutinies, uh, grading lesson observations, um, Oh, I can't remember the others. I'll tell you one of the big ones, though, the, the whole labelling culture. Mm. So if you took... Because, you know, I, I find the most ironic sort of uh, tagline for any company is Ofsted's. So you look at Ofsted and it goes, Ofsted, raising standards. Ofsted, don't raise standards. Ofsted, check standards to their own subjective views. Mm. If you took away the labelling culture from Ofsted, right, it completely changed the game because that's what everyone's aiming for, the label. And the labels mean nothing, don't mean anything really. Because if you're lucky enough to have an inspector who comes into your school after having a cracking weekend, want to bet on a horse or whatever, and decides, yeah, I like that, I like that, I like that, and you get the outstanding grade, then that's it then. You, you spend hundreds of pounds of your budget getting a massive banner outside your school, shouting to the rooftops about how outstanding you are, yet you might have kids who can't talk, you might just get good results. Kids who can't talk, you've got a staff turnover that is ridiculous. You might just have that one year group that did well, but yeah, yeah. next year, yeah. you know. And then down the road, there's a school working just as hard as you, uh, but they get an inspector who comes in who doesn't like what they're doing because they have their own subjective views on education. That requires improvement and they're fighting for the jobs. So at either end, whether you're outstanding requires improvement, the pressures of either improving or staying where you are is the reason why we've got all this obsession with accountability. So if you took away the labels, maybe, just maybe, we might be able to move forward with it a little bit. So, um, so yeah, maybe removing the labels would be a good start. Yeah. I feel like uh, everyone struggles with that question because it's so big. It's like just oh, yeah, not yeah. one thing, is it? Yeah. And just while we're on the life work, balance i just want to mention that um classroom secrets got a campaign and we're aiming for twenty thousand um entries because i want it to be really impactful Mm -hmm. i want to take it to downing street and we've got seven and a half thousand at the moment so if you're listening now is the time to get filling in that survey it's in the show notes the classroom secrets life work balance survey do that now help us out because we want to publish that report we want to get it in every school across the country and want it to make a difference. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, who's your inspiration within education? Oh, there's a few. When I was at school, there was a teacher called Mr. Crawford, who was an English teacher at secondary school. He was unbelievable. Oh, I loved him. 
I wasn't really into English that much when I was younger, but he he completely changed it. I was I was I was in awe of him. I always remember the first day. He, I had him on the first day of secondary school, and he came in and he had this golden ruler, and he used to just slap it against his hands, and he'd make us all stand up with our shoulders back. You know that thing of like, don't smile until Christmas. Yeah. He sort of did it first few weeks, and he had us all petrified of him, and then he just completely changed into this most the most lovable character. And he was just incredible. Uh, unfortunately, he passed away when I was at school. He, he ended up getting cancer. And it was the first funeral I ever went to, actually. And what was uh, amazing was we'd gone on a retreat uh, like the week before he died, and we'd all written these letters to him. And it was one of the last things he ever read before he died. And they got read out in the funeral. God, I was in bits. Yeah. It was an absolute bit. So uh, Mr. Crawford, uh, Alan Pete has just been incredible uh, from the moment I came across his resource. I still think now, even though he's not publishing the resources anymore, they stand the test of time because there's some of the best stuff out there for English. And there's loads of people now doing stuff that is basically a carbon copy of it. But if you've not come across this stuff before, alanpeat.com, buy some of his books. They're just unbelievable. Um, and obviously the support him and Julie have given me over the years have been, it won't be where I am without them. Yeah, and I think a lot of schools still use Alan Pete resources oh, yeah, as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, what did you want to be when you grew up? Uh, an actor. An actor. I, do you know what I've said as well? If this all goes to pot and, uh, you know, for whatever reason it stops and or sc the funding out, the funding gets so bad that schools can't afford CPD anymore, which a lot of schools can't at the minute, I'd probably give myself a year and I'd give acting another go. Well, you've already started building your social media, so yeah. just just do it in acting. I used instead. to. I did it quite a lot when I was younger, and I'd, I'd, I'd done a. I was a lost boy in Peter Pan at uh, the Palace Theatre with Toy Wilcox and Frank Finley back in the day. Uh, I was down to the last four to be in Hollyoaks at one time, but that was the turning point. So basically, when I was at secondary school, I was at a big rugby school, and we ended up we had the sevens tournament, a uh, big national sevens tournament, and I had to miss it because I had the Hollyoaks audition. And the amount of stick I got from the lads about missing the rugby because I did the, uh, I gave it up then. And it's the biggest regret I've ever had. I always talk to my kids about you it. You could do it on the side. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I always thought. But it's, a, it's that thing like it, it, in America now, all the big it, actors are all English. Yeah. It's Just true. all English. It's true. And Miss well, me chance. I thought, so I got to the end of my teaching degree, uh, no, sorry, my um, performing arts degree, and then I thought, oh, what am I going to do now? And all my friends said, oh, they were going to get an agent and move to London. And I thought, yeah. I don't want to work in a bar. So I thought, I'll, I'll do teaching to buy myself a year mm. because it was funded in performing arts at the time. They got a golden hello. And I thought, I know. I'll do supply. And then on the other days, I'll just go and, um, you know, be an extra or something to yeah. start with and go for auditions. But it turns out I like teaching. So, yeah. no, so maybe we do teaching. it together. I suppose I get my fix with the videos and the podcast and the live shows, so, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, where are we meant to be? Yeah. And, um, okay, what are the three biggest changes you've seen during your time in education? Oh, good question. Um, might be controversial again. I think the change in government has, has had a radical change in, in education. In my personal opinion, not for the better, for the worse. Um, I just think, uh, so obviously the curriculum and everything that comes with that and the accountability, again, links in with that. Um, I just think, I wouldn't say teaching was easy. It probably was easy when I started out because there wasn't as much pressure. And I just don't think teachers were blamed for everything when I first started, whereas now they are. Mm -hmm. We've got to be the answer for everything. So what was I read the other day? Um, I can't remember, but there was one report a while back where it was like, right, teachers have now got to solve the knife crime epidemic. Yeah. And it was like, right, if teachers, you don't, can't don't foreshadow. Don't worry, we'll train you on it. Yeah. If you can't foreshadow that a child in your class is going to go out and stab someone at the weekend, you're, you're going to be held accountable yeah, for yeah. that. So teachers now turn into Bran Stark, like, go to go now. <laughs> it's ridiculous. Um, so that's been a massive change. Uh, and obviously all, all the workload stuff, I just think, I, I just had so much freedom when I first started teaching. And we used to do so, you know, we did so much, so many creative little things, which I, I still get to do now, to be fair, but I think I'm in a bit of a more unique position. I think teachers aren't given that opportunity. Because I th just think the majority of teachers are so creative, but just the job beats it out of them because of all the faff they've got to do. So that would definitely be one. Um, 
I think social media's had, had a real impact on teaching, whether that's good or bad, I'm not sure. I think possibly it's opened CPD option. It's opened up, hasn't it? That experience of possibly other schools without moving to another school. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, you can be part of a global staff room and there's someone you know, some great Facebook groups where people are really supportive. But like I said before, it brings out the best and worst out of people. So I've really distanced myself from Twitter. I just find Twitter to be a real top, especially in the last few weeks, negative. really toxic and ne negative. And Dean, I just don't see what the point is. Like, obviously, people are going to disagree on things, but you see some really nasty stuff happening. And I just don't think social media is the place to have that debate, to be honest, because there's so much that gets lost in the translation. You lose that nuance of voice, don't you? So what you might type and say in your head doesn't translate to how yes. you interpret, you know, yes. we've all been or there. Somebody, how somebody else interprets it as well, yeah. So I, I try and stay away from that. I've, I've really trained myself to stay away from that negativity because I know there's not going to be everyone. I know there's going to be people who completely disagree with my viewpoints on things and my opinions, and that's fine. I'm just not going to take anyone on on social, social media. Social media also has a lot of experts, doesn't it? Oh, Self, Self-proclaimed experts. I hate when people reference me as an expert because I am not an expert at anything. Um, and no. that's how I feel as well. Yeah, I don't consider myself an expert. I think if you do, you, you set yourself up for failure. Because as soon as you put yourself on a pedestal, the, f the thing that our society wants to do is bring you down as fast yeah, as possible. Yeah. So, also, um, there's so much we don't know. Oh, yeah, absolutely, yeah. So uh, it's like whenever I get asked questions about a lot of the programming and coding stuff, I have to say, look, it's not my area of expertise. I can't help you there, I'm afraid. But these guys do. I'll send you that way. So, um, so, but, but, yeah, there's good things and bad things. And, you know, there's I mean, I've seen how amazing social media can be for me personally. Um, but then you've got, you know, parents use it to slag off teachers, which is a bad thing. And, but schools should utilise it more, I think. I think that if you utilise it and you set your stall out as a school to say, look, we're on this platform and we expect parents to be positive role models as well, which is what we've done in our school. We've not really had any negative incidents on Facebook, mm -hmm. but I know a lot of schools do. Yeah. And I want to say, well, why don't you have a Facebook page? It's like, oh, no, we can't because parents will slag us off. And I'm like, well, we'll do that anyway. At least you're in control a division of your school on that platform. Mm. Thank you. A last question now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Where do you think education needs to go in the next 10 years? Hmm. Where would I like it to go? Where do I think it's going to go? Where do you think it needs to go? So I suppose it's like... Yeah, yeah. I think it's going to get a lot worse and it gets better at the minute if I'm being... Uh, if I'm looking at it... Brutally honest. Brutally honest, yeah. Where I'd like it to go is I'd like it to be funded properly. Um, I'd like trust to be given back to teachers. Um, personally, I'd get rid of Ofsted. I don't think they serve the right purpose. I think, you know, as much as they say they raise standards, as I said, I don't think they do. And I think they contribute to a lot of the fear. And when you bring that fear in, you lose your common sense. So, um, uh, but I think there's, there's a way in which Ofsted could run where they don't add that pressure onto schools. And I think, to be honest, over the past couple of years, I've seen that massive change in Ofsted. And I don't actually, blame them directly anymore. I think the reputation they've had is hard to get away from. Mm. But I tell you where I, I, my issue with Ofsted at the minute now is more indirectly because Ofsted, I don't know how many publications they put out where they say, you don't need to do anything for Ofsted. Yeah. They've, made, they've had this uh, myths document out for years yeah. and yet I share it on my training and nine times out of 10, three quarters of them, haven't, teachers haven't seen it. Yeah. Have well, you seen the myth doc? Yeah, seen, it's, yeah, well, it's something I talk about as well. And sometimes it's not that. It's not always that they haven't seen it. It's that the head teacher won't adopt it. Yeah, yeah. So my issue now isn't directly with Ofsted. It's indirectly with SLTs yeah. who are still doing everything for Ofsted. Yeah. And if you've got that culture in your school, that's why our profession won't move forward. Yeah. And there's a lot of, don't get me wrong, there's a lot of schools who are, are, are following that guidance, not doing anything for Ofsted, because that's what Ofsted say. But there are still too many schools and it's like, look, you've got to look at the children. You've got to focus on the children, what's working for the children. And if you're doing everything for the children, Ofsted will see that, you know. So um, I think that that culture that uh, and I don't blame necessarily Ofsted for that, but the culture of Ofsted needs to change yeah. and schools Just need to make sure they're doing everything for the kids. Fear. And, yeah. I, and I, I, after experiencing it, I was in a school where the fear of Ofsted was very real. Yeah. It was, you know, a school... Um, which uh, was in special measures, and it 
it is almost like when I think about it now, I can see it because it was so thick. Yeah. That fear, it just covers the entire and, school, and and yeah. nothing seems to make a difference. Yeah. And even if they got off studied, they'd probably still get required improvement yeah. because they're not doing it for the kids. No. Um, some great schools like, um, uh, who's the one I was talking to on Twitter recently? Three Bridges down in London, have you heard of them? The head teacher there is amazing. He's great. He's, he's exactly what I've been talking about there. Taking away the accountability, taking away the fear, just doing everything for the kids in a real sort of deprived area. And they've just been off study inspected, got outstanding in every area because they've not focused on that. They've just focused on doing what's right for them. Mm -hmm. And then you get you get your rewards naturally. So uh, so hopefully we'll get in a better place. I'd love, I'd love technology to be used more effectively because I think um, it's not going anywhere. Social media is ingrained in our society now and we're at risk of creating another generation of kids who grow up and can't make decisions mm -hmm. out of fact, out of truth they don't have an understanding of social media, so they fall into the traps of fake news and, and that sort of stuff. So I'd love us to, re when we're talking about this curriculum, actually take on board the digital literacy stuff, which I think is so crucial now. Um, you know, I sometimes sort of mention the whole handwriting stuff in schools and, you know, I'm not against handwriting, kids need to learn how to handwrite, but the amount of emphasis and time we put on a skill that once children leave school, they never publish anything handwritten. Uh, is, is it, um once they leave school, or do they just? Is it as soon as they get into year seven, they just lose it? Possibly, possibly. But let's let, let's let's. When was the last time you had to handwrite anything for someone else to read? Uh, the only thing I handwrite is my to-do list. <laughs> but who's that for? Myself. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. So, what what's come from research is that if you're handwriting notes from a training session, for example, those notes will stick with you more than if you were typing them. So handwriting is a very valuable skill, but it's a skill for us. Mm -hmm. It's not something we publish. No. So. When we talk about like word processing skills, I don't consider that a computing. No. That's English. It's literacy. Yeah. yeah. That's that's. It's a what, life skill now, yeah, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. So I'm not against schools doing 20 minutes of handwriting practice a day because I say it's a valuable skill. We need it for note taking and, and that sort of thing. But why can't we match that then with t 20 minutes of typing practice a day? Yes. Knowing that that can be more accessible for children yeah. and just find that balance. And that's what it is with technology. It's all about balance and it's all about making the right choices with it. Uh, we do some amazing things with tech. We, we, we're changing the world in so many amazing ways. Like um, I was reading about Bill Gates has done this massive investment into a company out of Harvard, I think, who are looking at putting something in space that's going to uh, dim the amount of sun. So it'll stop global, uh, stop climate change. Wow. I don't know if that's exactly right, but that's what, yeah. you, know, you know, that's amazing. But then at the same time, we make some terrible choices with the tech, um, like parenting, like, Honest to God, like I've just come back off holiday and, the, and it, we went to like an all-inclusive. I'm, my kids have access to it. They don't have their own devices. My 16-year-old does, but the kids, the triplets don't because they don't need it. Mm -hmm. And they can have it if, you know, they get up at half six in the morning and I'm not getting up till eight, that's fine. But the amount of families that would go to the restaurant and the kids would just be sat on devices and it's one of my biggest bugbears. Mm -hmm. like, I'm a complete, if we're at the table, we're having a meal, everything goes away. Mm -hmm. This is the time that I want to, and I'm not perfect, because my kids have a go at me about looking at my phone all the time, but um, yeah, it's, it winds me up, because it's just, it's just crap parenting. <laughs> it's, it's the main reason why we've got all these issues. And you know, uh, this uh, prams you can buy now, like come with built-in iPad holders. I've seen one, one, I was working at a school in Liverpool, and a mum walked past and she had this pram with an iPad, in, in built into the pram. And I'm just like, what are we doing? We don't need that for, for oh, babies that can go in a I've, pram. I've, I've been to friends' houses where They're the happy kids... just looking at the sky. Yeah, I've been to friends' houses where the kids watch so much YouTube. When I left, the kids said, um, right, see you later, don't forget to subscribe. So they've watched that much YouTube. <laughs> they take that saying? phrase as like a farewell. Yeah. Oh, it's, it's great. So, um, that's just a really poor choice. Another report, a quarter of parents now use Alexa and Siri to read bedtime stories to the kids. Yeah. And I'm just like... When you mentioned you that to me yesterday, bothered, I was so shocked at that. If you can't be bothered to take time to read to your own child at night, if that's not... They're not going to love it if you don't. Yeah. What, why are you a parent? Why, what, you know, and I know society is busy, we've, we've got work more than we've ever... But, you know, 
Yeah, yeah. It it's just choices, yeah, it's choices. Um, and I think that's what influences a lot of teachers negatively about technology because that's all they ever see is the poor choices. Um, and what I try and show teachers is actually, if we use technology in the right way, it can be incredibly powerful yeah. and make learning so much access more accessible. Just just things like um, Siri, you know, you've got my kids, both my boys, are both dyslexic, and they really struggle with the whole phonics stuff. And now, if they're ever doing any writing, they'll have Siri there for the spelling. Mm -hmm. And they, they could, I don't know if it'll work here. Hey Siri. Does it no. have to be put in? I don't know. I could do it on my watch. No. But um, how do you spell beautiful? Beautiful. B E A U T. You know. And it just does it for you. Yeah, we don't even use that in school. Do you know what I mean? I, I, yeah, we still in 2019 will say, you can't spell that word. We'll go and get that dictionary, that book full of other words you can't spell, and uh, good luck. Yeah, we've got these devices. And, I, and so it's like just getting teachers to see the potential and the opportunities and the way in which it can support learning yeah. and not necessarily be a negative just thing. Just get it out for 45 minutes a week is yeah. what you're saying. Yeah. 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 Well, thank you so much. Um, oh, right, uh, well yeah, done yeah. to the listeners if you've managed to yeah, listen yeah. this long because it's been epic. Oh, thank you. Um, but yeah, I've really enjoyed having you on the podcast. Thank oh, you no, thank you for that. so much for, for coming on and um, definitely have a listen to Lee's podcast as well that you do. Is yeah. it Adam, your brother? To Mr. P's podcast dot com. Yeah put that in the show notes as well yeah, brilliant. so hopefully uh, we're both now working on getting you as teachers to listen to podcasts mm -hmm. um, because it is the future yeah there's a good a fair few other good ones so um one that was listening on holiday uh, the beta project i think which is the interview with that head teacher at the three bridges uh brain ed comedy do an amazing um like uh it's like a sitcom, bit of a mick take of teaching. That's quite funny as well. So, yeah, check them out as well. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you so much. No, thank you for having me. Thank you.